can get started with Michael once I'm done with that. We do like to start with a uh, land acknowledgement. Sorry, land acknowledgement each time. This is really important to us as stewards of our lands, and we hope that you stay mindful um, of these words each time that you hear them. So we would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Wandat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence here continues to this day. We would also like to acknowledge the land we are on is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as our closest Indigenous community. We acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation mm -hmm. is recognizing the existence of Indigenous mm -hmm. people. A shared understanding of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk together into a better future. We give deep gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. The Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust endeavors to honor this land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. Thank you. Okay, and in terms of the Oak Ridges Moraine, some of us may not know a lot about it. So it is home to hundreds of rare and at-risk species. It is also a source of drinking water for over 250,000 people. So it makes it really, really important. This is a map of the Oak Ridges Moraine. So as you can see, it uh, is very narrow, but it is very long. And a lot of us live in and around uh, the Oak Ridges Moraine. A little bit more about it. The Oak Ridges Moraine is mm -hmm. home to over um, uh, five percent of wetlands, or sorry, it's made up of five percent of wetlands. There are also other really interesting water or aqua aquatic habitats, and ninety percent of the moraine is in private ownership, which is, which is sort of where we come in. In terms of the trust, we are a registered charity that works to protect ecologically valuable land. We get helps from governments, uh, communities, and individual donations to hold and steward our properties. We have over 4,400 acres across 60 properties, and this land is actually protected forever. This is a map that shows where our properties are. So as you can see, we stretch in and around the moraine, even though our main office is in Newmarket. Um, we try our best to protect in and around the moraine without setting an actual boundary. In terms of how we get this land, one of the programs we use is the Ecological Gifts Program. So it is a uh, partnership program with landowners that offers a significant tax benefit um, when they donate their land or do a conservation easement. And this is a really fantastic way that we've been able to, to uh, steward land and protect it forever federally. In terms of our outreach and education programs, you should know a little bit about this, considering this webinar would count towards that. And we do have a few upcoming free programs. We are still trying to figure out for the summer what we can do in person and virtually. So we do webinars, uh, guided or self-guided walks, Olympics and challenges, and more whenever we can, uh, whenever we can do it. We do have upcoming or one more upcoming webinar. Um, it is on moss and it is much more exciting than a lot of people would think. It's actually going to be on May 20th. We did change that date, so sorry about that. And one more thing we're adding and doing for the first time are all-star challenges. So these are going to be fantastic. We're going to have sort of team captains who are experts. They're going to be attending our properties and doing species inventories and competing for top birder, top ecologist, and top mother. The best part is you can join a team, cheer them on, and find species in your own neighborhood to add to their score. All right, so that's going to be it from me, and I'm going to pass it on to Michael. Well, good evening, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Sorry, yes, I can. Sorry. Okay, good. I've had a little bit of computer problems. So that's good. Anyways, I'm very happy to come back again for a second presentation for the the uh, uh, land trust, a really important group who's protecting so much of the habitat that remains in the Oaks uh, in the Oak Ridge Marine. And um, just want to get my PowerPoint up here. Here we go. So I was asked to speak about mammals to you, and uh, and that is what the topic will be. And you know, when people think of of animals in general, you know, they don't think of other kinds of of animals. Mammals come to mind, but these aren't the only animals. 
of course. Uh, we have birds, which are animals. Amphibians, like the gray tree frog here, are animals. Turtles and other reptiles are animals. Hi, we can't Fish. share screen. Oh no, oh no, oh <laughs> no. Like to share screen. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll start over. Yeah, okay, people say animals. Often they only think of mammals. So often I see birds and animals. But mammals are a kind of animal, of course. And other animals besides mammals include things such as birds, amphibians like great tree frogs, turtles and other reptiles, fish, and even insects, especially those popular ones that are coming out right now. But these are all animals. But mammals are just a group of animals. And they are different in that they have, well, they're warm-blooded, uh, they're, they're endothermic as their property known, they have hair, they nurse, uh, they're young with milk, and so on. And they range in size from really large animals like white-tailed deer to very small animals like eastern chipmunks and even smaller. In fact, for every large animal we have, there are myriad small mammals uh, in our area. So many, many more small mammals. And if you look at mammals, you can break them down to different groups. For example, it can be, they could be a, uh, a member of the squirrel family or the rodent order, or it could be carnivore uh, with separate uh, groups like uh, canids, which include foxes and wolves and so on. Or you can look at them in a general way and how they get their food. And that's what I'll do to start off here, sort of look at different ways these mammals get food. And of course, there are the herbivores that devour vegetation. And plants really fuel the mammal world because uh, plants feed everything else pretty well that mammals feed on. And everything from groundhog, as we just saw, to snowshoe hare are uh, herbivores. Now, plants are a really tough thing to eat, though. They are full of defense of compounds. Even their structures that give them their shape are hard to digest. So mammals have to get ways around this. And, and everything from leaves to bark to nuts and so on poses a real problem. So how do they get around this? Well, for one thing, for the chemicals inside the plants, uh, mammals have things called MFOs, not things that fly around the sky at night, but MFOs will help neutralize those plant toxins. And plant tissues being so tough require special tools to break them apart for digestion inside. Um, mammals like white-tailed deer have really big molars and premolars, big cheek teeth that grind away. And these have a big rough surface, a very tough rough surface for breaking through the cellulose and other components that plants are comprised of. And so things like white-tailed deer will chew and chew and chew and munch and finally swallow. In the case of white-tailed deer, they have another tool inside. The first part of their stomach is called the rumen, and it's full of all kinds of microorganisms that help digest their food. And of course, these microorganisms, besides breaking down the food, get their own nutrition in the process. Um, but even then, the plant tissues are really hard to digest. So what do deer do? Well, they cough up the food and chew it again in the form of a cud. And they swallow that and that gets more digest, further di digested then. So you have this symbiotic relationship between deer and the internal organisms. The deer gets their food broken down for them. And what do the small animals get inside? They get free room and board, of course, is what they get. Porcupines also are herbivores, and they devour a lot of bark off trees and leaves and twigs and that sort of thing. Um, they haven't got a rumen, but they have super long intestines. Like if you just, well, you wouldn't want to stretch one out, but if you ever see a roadkill uh, porcupine, have a look at the insides of it if you can. They're incredibly long. So the longer surface for digestion, uh, porcupines are able to glean the nutrients from those plant tissues. And by the way, these are remarkable animals, aren't they? They can climb, they have incredible claws that are highly curved and they can shimmy up a tree 
uh, with great ease. And this fellow here, you can see him, he's got his four arms up on the tree, and then they scamper up, just like a fireman up a pole. Even the tail has been found to help in the way they climb. It's got a very rough muscular surface on the inside, and they can push that against a tree to give them further support. But unfortunately, porcupines aren't infallible. They can climb to great heights, but often they have accidents. This porcupine here I was watching, and it was up fairly high in a small tree trying to get twigs to eat. It was a very, very windy day, and the tree was rocking back and forth wildly. And all of a sudden, this porcupine reached for a branch, the tree separated at the top, and it fell down about 15 meters to the ground. I heard the sickening thud, it was in November, and the ground was frozen, and it landed on a rocky area. I went over to it, and, and unfortunately, it was just on its last breath, its eyes closed. Porcupines though, often do survive falls, and studies on them have found through x-rays, they often have broken bones inside that have healed. So falling out of a tree is not rare for a porcupine, but sadly, this fellow here didn't make it. Another uh, group of animals that uh, eats a lot of vegetation uh, are the hares and rabbits, the ligomorphs. And uh, they have an interesting process. They eat their plant tissues. They have a first pass through the body that comes out rather soft, not like this. They eat that soft material and further process the food inside it and then the harder pellets come out. So when you see a, a, a snowshoe hare or contail uh, rabbits droppings, you're seeing a second pass through the body. You know, when you think about this as coprophagy, as it's known as eating your own droppings, uh, that must give these animals very bad breath. I wouldn't want to smell a rabbit or, or a cottontail, a snowshoe hare or a cottontail. Uh, beavers also eat their own droppings after the first pass through. So rabbits and hares aren't unique in this. Of course, beavers are famous for eating a lot of woody material, and they certainly do that very well. By the way, during COVID, beavers have been putting on their masks before they dine. Very, uh, very good social animals, aren't they? Um, they forage a lot on land, but they're really more at home in the water. And on land, uh, beavers tend to do their chores. They're cutting down trees and uh, fetching plant material to eat in a, uh, in a very quick fashion. And then they bring this to the water to eat it. So they generally eat in the water safety. And uh, things like virgin bower uh, are soft tissue plants, they'll eat those, but they also eat a lot of bark and twigs. And, and beavers on land fell through, or cut through these uh, smaller shrubs and even bigger trees uh, with great speed. It's quite remarkable how fast they can do it and they cut them down and they haul them back to the water. Now, this beaver is sleeping, but it shows you how large their mouth can open. And it also shows you their incredible teeth that are used to cut through plant tissues. Beavers are a type of rodent, and that includes the squirrels and mice and voles and, and a few other uh, groups. And their teeth all have this wonderful orange outer coating have you ever wondered why they have orange teeth? Is it because they don't brush enough? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, what's really remarkable is the outside is orange because it's full of iron. Iron gives the enamel strength. Of course, if you're chewing through tough plant tissues, you require really strong teeth. So these teeth are reinforced on the outside. Another remarkable feature of their teeth is that the inside of a tooth is not orange. It's a softer material, uh, dentine. And what happens is it wears faster than the outer part does because it's not reinforced with that iron. And so through differential wear, these beaver's teeth always stay sharp, as do other rodents' teeth. And not just that, uh, they never stop growing. So even as the outer part wears down, the teeth always replaces itself. So you can imagine we had that kind of teeth. Think of the money we'd save at the dentist if our teeth always kept on growing. Well, not the case for us, unfortunately. So beavers do use their powerful teeth and, and, and to, to fell trees, 
because part of their diet certainly is the bark and material uh, found in trees. Just recently, just to, actually last week, I actually followed a beaver into the forest. And that was a bit difficult because beavers stop and they smell and they, they listen for danger. So you have to match their movements with your movements. But I followed a beaver into the woods and it came to a small poplar stand. And here's the remarkable thing about beavers. They smell their food to identify it before they either eat it or cut it down. So first of all, you gotta ascertain that that is the kind of tree they wanna cut down. And this beaver went to a poplar group, a trembling aspen group, their favorite kind of tree to fell because the bark is full of chlorophyll and very nutritious and easy also to, to, to peel off. And uh, it went to a poplar stand and it began to sniff. It went to six different trembling aspens and smelled but didn't cut them. It finally came to a seventh that it liked. In a matter of seconds, it cut down the sapling, which had dried back to the water through the heavy vegetation, uh, very tough pull for the beaver. Cross the road, you can see where it first came up from the other side by from a creek, down into the water where it began to cut off smaller branches and devour them. And the smaller branches, by the way, the very thin ones were just shoved into the mouth and chewed steadily and down they went. Larger branches had the bark peeled off them. The same way we sort of eat a corn of the cob. So it would chew along the edge of a branch, turn it around, chew it again and get that bark off. And I mentioned the power of smell they have. There's a study in Alaska that was done on beavers and, and one of their favorite foods in the north are willow trees. And up there, there were seven types of willows growing. Beavers only ate three of them. And beavers never cut down the species they didn't like. That is how incredible their power of smell is. And then to actually see one discriminate between individuals of the same species, to me really you know, revealed how incredible that disc discrimination ability is. Beavers, by the way, also eat a lot of water plants. And when they go to shore, they'll bring plants from the land back to the water, but they'll also eat water plants. And their favorites include the water lilies, especially the yellow pond lily. And they'll devour the leaves, the stems, the underwater rhizomes, and even the flowers. Every part is food for a beaver. Other animals come down to eat some aquatic plants. Moose, and of course, in the Oak Ridges Moraine area, white-tailed deer are the prevalent large ungulate there, but they'll come down too to, to eat some water plants. And this was a very funny moment. There's always some humor in nature that, that Joe encountered from time to time. So this white-tailed deer was down eating some water plants, which are very high in sodium, by the way. It was walking along the edge very carefully and it stepped on a stick and the stick came up and the deer stared at it, then got a bit nervous and walked around it on the shoreline and came back to the water again. But the whole time uh, it, it was watching it, then it stepped on it again. And this time the deer bolted and took off and never saw it again. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so the plant tissues are hard to eat, but then some of the plant products like nuts are extremely hard to get through. And of course, that's where those powerful incisors come in, in the case of the Eastern chipmunk. By the way, chipmunks are standard, uh, you know, the brown striped. And by the way, the stripe pattern of a, a chipmunk is for camouflage. When they sit still in the forest, either on the ground or on a tree trunk, these stripes help break up their body shape and make them harder to see as an organism, unless they move. Um, these patterns are called disruptive patterns, and many birds have them on their face to hide on the nest and so on, but chipmunks have them on their backs, and also on their facial structure too. It's got these, these patterns to help them hide. Sometimes you get color aberrations. Uh, there are more and more black chipmunks being seen in eastern Ontario. These are melanistic. And that means that these animals produce too much dark coloration and that makes them entirely black. In chipmunks, it, has, it was quite rare originally, but becoming more common. But for some small mammals, 
melanism is actually pretty common. And that's the case with gray squirrels. Now, people often call them black squirrels and gray squirrels. But even the black ones are gray ones that are melanistic. And this form is more common in the northern part of the gray squirrels range. It may be an advantage for absorbing solar energy uh, on those cold winter days. And by the way, they spread north only in the last roughly 100 years into the uh, central part of Ontario. Uh, possibly because of trees being planted like mantel, uh, sorry, mantel maple that have keys, but also bird feeders that help sustain these animals in winter. Here is a gray form that tends to be more common as you go farther south. But you also get other, other color variations too. Here's the two colors together. How about this beautiful blonde one? And you see a few of these on occasion. And not only is it a fairly rare coloration of, of the gray squirrel, it, has one, it is one probably, I guess, has a little more fun as well, this blonde form. Sometimes you get a mixture of the colors appearing on a, a gray squirrel. So all sites, sorts of color variations uh, can be found. Even this one. Now this puzzled me for the longest time. I was paddling in the canoe in November on a creek and I saw this white thing struggling in the water, barely alive. I thought, what is that? It crawled onto a log on the shore and turned around. I looked at it and photographed it. And I thought, what is it? What is it? Then I realized it was a gray squirrel, but it had several problems. One, it was almost drowned, but the other ones were, it was an albino, and also had mange, so lost a lot of the hair. This poor animal had little chance for survival. And that's often the case with genetic variations where sometimes they don't uh, give the animal much survival ability. And again, uh, you know, mental maples provide a lot of food for these squirrels and possibly why they spread north. But these squirrels are tree squirrels and they are very acrobatic. They climb up high, they devour uh, acorns and other seeds and fruits. And they also eat, in this case, here's red oak flowers coming up, eats them as well. Now this squirrel looks pretty bold and confident, doesn't it? And they are very confident because they can scramble up these trees, they can leap from tree to tree, and they're fearless. They're also extremely clever. Um, bird feeders have been made squirrel proof, so called, because there's a weight activated bar that if squirrels get above the baffle, they can uh, not pull it down. Well, is that the case? Here we have a, a, a very clever uh, gray squirrel, the, the dark form, that's leaping and actually got on top of the feeder and learned it could reach down and extract seeds from the uh, part that's weight activated without activating it. Quite clever. Red squirrels uh, are also quite clever as well in solving uh, bird feeders, aren't they? Red squirrels tend to be more common where there's conifers. Gray squirrels like the deciduous forest with things like acorns and maple keys and uh, hickory nuts and that sort of thing. But red squirrels are more northern generally, and they're found in the coniferous areas because one of their favorite foods uh, are, is the seeds inside a, a, a cone of a conifer. This guy is doing a Clint Eastwood impersonation, I think, from Dirty, not Dirty Harry, but his previous movies with as a cowboy. But uh, they take down these this cones of pines and spruces and they nip off the scales with their incisors and then devour the seeds hidden inside. And they may even spit out the kales, scales. Generally they, they nip them off, but sometimes they get one of them out and they spit it out then. They will also eat though things like hickory nuts and, and walnuts and that sort of thing if they're available. So they have a, a, a diet a bit more diverse than a gray squirrel does. And by the way, besides eating the uh, plant material, Red squirrels also eat other animals and they will eat young nestling birds and so on, as will chipmunks, by the way, which are great climbers. 
So even though these animals are thought to be herbivores, their journey a little more varied in their diet. One intriguing aspect of red squirrels is apparent right now. If you walk around coniferous trees, you often find the nipped off uh, uh, new growth on the ground surrounding the tree. Well, what's happening there? That's caused by red squirrels because red squirrels go up and they'll nip off a, the, the new growth and they'll nibble off the buds on the end and drop the rest down below. And they may also get a bit of, of sap from that, uh, from that uh, cut off piece as well or the piece left behind on the tree. And they must have a sweet tooth. This is a sweet tongue. This, this, uh, these sets of holes are made by a yellow-bellied sapsucker, a bird that uh, extracts sap from these whales and keeps them open. Well, this red squirrel was going to a sapsucker well tree and licking the sap coming out of those holes. So they have even a liquid uh, bit of their diet as well. Now, they, these are really cheeky, vociferous animals. They'll scold you all the time you go into the forest. It's pretty well difficult to sneak through a forest if red squirrels are present. So they're pretty bold animals. They're also intriguing for their behaviors. They're very vocal, but sometimes they seem to be whispering to each other. And I'm really not sure what's going on here, but some secrets being shared and then some very odd behavior ensued. And I'm not sure what's going on here at all. By the way, red squirrels and, and gray squirrels are diurnal squirrels. Uh, after the sun sets, so another squirrel comes out. If you have bird feeders offering peanuts, especially or sunflower seeds, you may get visited by a flying squirrel. In the Oak Ridge's moraine area, most of the uh, squirrels, flying squirrels, will be southern flying squirrels. There may be a few northerns on occasion. As you go farther north, the northern flying squirrels replace the southern flying squirrels. They're very similar. Uh, southern flying squirrels are smaller. They have pure white hair in the belly and chin area that's white to the base, while uh, northerns are more gray uh, and other subtle differences too. Now, by the way, for many of these nocturnal mammals, if you shine a light on them, you see their eyes glowing in the dark. They have eye shine. And that's because at the back part of their eye is a special set of cells that reflect light back forward again. Because if you're out in the daytime, there's so much light going to your eye, you can waste a lot of it. But if you're night active, every bit of light is important. And therefore, if some goes through your eye, through the sensory cells, but misses them, it's the back of the eye, it's not wasted, it bounces forward again, giving it a second chance to hit a receptor cell, which in the case of nocturnal mammals are parts of uh, uh, cells called rods. And uh, mammals that are active by day and by night uh, have these as well, usually. Uh, so we have animals that are herbivores primarily. And then we have, of course, the other group, the predatory animals we call carnivores. And they have different teeth. They, of course, have large canine teeth developed for grabbing and maybe just dismembering prey. Some also have good cheek teeth as well because they may have a more omnivorous diet where they also eat some fruit as well as, as small mammals and birds. Red foxes though tend to be, they will eat fruit, but they also eat a lot of game and that will range in size from as large as a mallard duck or maybe a groundhog and right down to small mice and voles. They also love turtle eggs and they don't really uh, watch a turtle laying eggs and get the eggs that way. They look around on the ground for a place where turtles have nested. Once the turtle has laid her eggs, she covers it up with soil. And she also often makes several dummy nests around in case the predator comes along and starts to dig. Well, this fox found one. I watched it walk along a roadside edge, sniffing, this is a daybreak by the way, sniffing and sniffing and sniffing, and across the road several times to both sides. So I followed it quietly, and finally it came to one spot where it began to dig furious, furiously. And you can see this, the dirt here flying up behind its, uh, its legs. 
They dug and dug, and then it pulled up a turtle egg in its mouth, which it very carefully sliced open with its canines and then licked out the contents. When you find a, a depredated turtle nest, you find the shells lying around and they're not crushed, they're sliced open. Uh, so this is an amazing thing to me that a fox can find a turtle nest by smell alone, even though the eggs are hidden down, hidden down several inches below the soil surface. Other animals, of course, too, are very fond of, of turtle eggs. Uh, skunks are. They are omnivores, they eat a lot of plant material, digging up roots and so on, but they also will eat turtle eggs. Um, raccoons certainly will, and even coyotes will. Coyotes though, are primarily predators of small mammals and birds. Most Eastern coyotes, I call them Eastern coyotes because they are a bit different than uh, Western coyotes in the prairies from where they came originally. Uh, for various reasons, but generally they are this gray-brown color. However, there is a lot of variation, and you even get this less common blonde phase. Black bears are thought to be pretty uh, top of the food chain sort of thing in terms of their diet, because they will eat moose calves and white-tailed deer fawns and other uh, animals as well, but they are truly omnivorous and their diet is, is varied. And by the way, a lot of people are very afraid of black bears. They think of them as highly dangerous animals, but for the most part, they're rather timid. And I spend a lot of time trying to sneak up on black bears to photograph them. And once they sense you, either by hearing or by smell, they journey will stand up like this and take off well, not always stand up, but they sometimes stand up to get a better view. And once they ascertain that you're a human, then off they go. By the way, female black bears have much larger ears than male black bears do. They also have an incredibly long tongue, by the way. Um, they use their tongue a lot for extracting uh, food like yellow jacket larvae from the ground. They're quite fond of wasp nests, which they dig up and they use their tongue to extract the food. They also use that tongue to pull blueberries off, off the plants. If you ever look at bear droppings, you'll see the seeds, the plants inside that they have eaten. So you'll see seeds of elderberry, blueberry, raspberry, that sort of thing. But you don't see twigs in there or leaves. That's because those incredible tongues can extract those, those uh, fruits from the plant without uh, other debris coming in too. Bears are also very fond of, of gr insect grubs and they're very being very powerful animals. They can lift up rocks as big as this, which I could never lift up with help of somebody else even my size and, uh, and then they get the food underneath. And here's one going after though, the softer things of blueberries. And by the way, people often think that these animals are exploiting uh, the plants for food. That's what I was taught when I was young, but that's going back a hundred years. Um, but now we know that it's the other way around. The plant is exploiting the bear. Uh, the fruit on it is just an edible enticement to get the mammal to come to eat it. The mammal devours it. The fruit is separated inside the body. The soft flesh is separated from the seed. The sea's not wanted, it's passed out in the droppings. So black bears and other mammals, and even birds, of course, that eat the fruit of plants like blueberries are doing the plant a favor by spreading the seeds around. They're being exploited by the plant. The plant is not being exploited by them. By the way, black bears are very fond of dandelions in spring. And when they're wandering around open areas, one of the first things they'll go for, if it's available, is a dandelion. So those of you who have lawns with a few yellow flowers coming up, don't bother getting a, a sprayer or dig them up. Just get a black bear to come. It'll do the job for you quite nicely. Now, black bears are great tree climbers. And they have incredible claws. And this is one of my favorite photographs that I've taken. Uh, it did take a little bit of courage, but, but I got what I wanted. You can see the claws of the bear, which are, of course, if you're a young white-tailed deer or a moose calf, 
these are a clause for concern, I'd say. But you can also see the really rough pads here that enable the bear to grip, uh, grab onto a tree and get really good uh, grip on it. And they're great climbers. And they climb uh, to, to get food. And primarily in, in the fall, they'll climb certain trees to get the nuts. They're very, very fond of American beech and also red oak acorns. In spring, they may even climb poplar trees to get newly opening leaves uh, off those trees. So they will eat uh, uh, tree products, not only on the ground, but also high up on the tree itself. When they climb American beaches, by the way, they climb as high as they can. And they're not as daring as porcupines. They stay in a pretty good solid uh, part of the tree but they'll reach out and with their massive arms, they'll break off branches to pull them to eat the fruit off or the nuts off them. What happens as a result, of, as a result, you get this great tangle of broken limbs that looks like a giant bird nest. And these are known as bear nests. And they're very common in places where there's large beech trees and black bears. Other predators climb very well too, not just black bears. And a couple of the weasel family are very adept at climbing trees, especially the American marten. And they'll climb trees to possibly chase squirrels. That's debatable though, but apparently they will do that. They'll eat fruit of trees and so on. And they do spend a lot of time also on the ground looking for small mammals and, and that sort of thing. A larger relative of the marten is the fisher. And fishers have had a great success story in Ontario where at one time they were less common, but through the years, their population has grown. And especially in Southern Ontario, it's grown. And it was thought for quite a while that these fisher were coming down from Algonquin Park, or there were false stories that they were being released by the natural resources to, to enhance the population. Well, it turns out through DNA studies that the, that the fishers down in the St. Lawrence River area and a bit further south have come not from the north, but from the south. They've actually come from the Adirondacks and crossed over into Ontario, and that population has grown over the years too. These are remarkable predatory animals, and they will eat a variety of small mammals and birds and larger ones like snowshoe hare and even tackle porcupines. They're not dangerous to humans. I saw this incredible story in the Kingston Whig Standard recently, how somebody claimed that their two fishers were stalking him and one was above him in the tree and jumped on his head, attacked his head while the other waited below. And he had to fight him off, as he said to the newspaper reporter, who must have been pretty gullible, that he fought them uh, hand to claw combat. They do not ta tackle people. Now, fishers have the most remarkable reproductive system of any mammal we have in Ontario. They mate, as you can see here, usually by the end of March. So they, they mate here. And the season passes on December, January, February, March. They give birth in late March, which means that they mate only a few days or even a week after giving birth. But is there pregnancy then about 11 and a half months? No, it's only about a month and a bit. And that's because carnivores have this remarkable mating system where they can breed at a time that's optimal for their activity and then give birth at a time that's also good for them. So often that's separated by some time. So instead of having a long pregnancy, which would be not a good thing for, for a female uh, carnivore or for any mammal for that matter, they have the sperm eat the egg when they mate and the cells start dividing and form a blastocyst, an early stage of development of the embryo, and it stops there. That does not implant to the uterus wall at that time. It floats around like a little spaceman in, 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 in space. Then eventually, after a period of time has passed, 
and in this case, you know, almost 11 months, then it implants in the uterus wall and pregnancy begins. And then the uh, uh, offspring is born after that. So remarkable delayed, it's called delayed implantation, meaning that the, the implanting of the developing embryo in the uterus wall doesn't occur until much later after mating occurs. Very, very interesting system for carnivores, very pronounced in the fisher. So we have predators uh, in the land, on the land. We also have predators in the water. This really shows the mammal's ability uh, to conquer various habitats. Of course, when you think of water and aquatic predators, you think of the otter. And otters are such incredible fishermen. Fish do form a big part of their diet. And often fish that are less uh, th thought of as being great game fish for fishermen. They're not really competing with fishermen, but they will take bass and walleye and, and even, I suppose, small pike and that sort of thing. But they do tend to feed on a lot of fish like here, this bullhead. But they also will eat turtles. And um, they will take, this is the, I think the first time it was officially recorded for small painted turtles. Uh, one early spring I saw an otter coming on top of the ice in a beaver pond and crunching on something that had dropped and that small thing began to move slightly and they grabbed it again. Then, it beaver, then the otter went down and brought something else on top, another small item. The next day at daybreak I went back to the pond and threw a log out to get out the ice and extracted these two small painted turtles. One was half eaten, the other had the head gone and a leg was gone or another leg was partly eaten. And you can see the otter's tooth marks through the shells. They're also known to eat large snapping turtles that are down being dormant uh, in late winter. And what they'll do is they will either under the water bite off the head because uh, snapping turtles can not pull inside the shell as other turtles can and legs and that sort of thing or even haul them up on the ice occasionally and devour the soft, softer parts there. Um, so otters are remarkable predators that are adapted for catching fish under the water, but on occasion, they will take turtles, even these really small painted turtles that were dormant in the bottom of the pond. They're very curious mammals, aren't they? And if you wanna see an otter up close, there's an easy trick to do. When they have, uh, they get a bit alarmed, they have an alarm call they give. It sounds like a snort. And if you can emulate that by going, <laughs> they will, if they're, if they're on solid land or on ice, they'll stand up and look at you. In the water, they'll stick their heads out of the water and they'll often come closer. So that's a good little trick for, for drawing in an otter. And they are so much fun. You get family groups together in late summer and uh, the trio can be quite uh, curious too if you're doing those little huffing and puffing sounds they make. While otters can travel the full breadth of a lake or beaver pond or river, uh, near the shore is where you find their smaller relative, the mink. Mink are sort of semi-aquatic. Otters are fully aquatic. But mink are semi-aquatic. They hunt along the shore quite a bit, but they will go in the water, of course, and dive for fish. This one's caught a small walleye. The shoreline, though, is where you tend to find them. And they'll scamper along the shoreline, getting frogs and small animals there, but they'll also go in the water to get aquatic organisms, too. One thing about predatory animals of interest is that their eyes are situated on the front of their face. If you look at a white-tailed deer or a snowshoe hare, the eyes are on the side of the head. Animals that are herbivores that face a lot of danger from larger predators tend to have eyes on the side to have a wider field of view of the world around them. In fact, snowshoe hares can see both in front and back at the same time incredible vision to see what's where danger is coming from. But predators want to have their eyes at the front of the face because that gives them 
a, a greater depth of field because there's more overlap in the two fields of view of the eyes. And that allows them to judge more precisely uh, how far away their food is. And so here's a great example in this mink of how the eyes are located on the front of the face. Mink will often, I think Hope said mink there, on the mink's face. Mink will often hunt, I found, in beaver food piles. Beavers pile up branches by the edge of the water for winter consumption. And small fish are attracted because they like tangles, they like shelter. I've seen mink often hunting in beaver food piles in late fall. They are active year round, as are all the carnivores for the most part. Um, the only one that's uh, semi-hibernating is the black bear. They don't fully hibernate, um, but uh, they do go dormant for the winter. But the other uh, animals, the other uh, carnivores certainly are very, very active. Now I mentioned the eyes on, on um, herbivores. Um, because they face danger from the carnivores, they have to have special senses available to escape them. And uh, they have the eyes, but they also have ears that are quite large. And many of the herbivores have enlarged ears for capturing sound, magnifying sound. And they can pivot those ears around to uh, face backwards. They're always scanning their environment. If you want to hear sounds larger, pretend you're a deer and put your hand behind you, your cup here, here. That enlarges the surface area that's capturing sound. And that's why we hear better if you put your uh, ear behind your head. Of course, the second defense of deer is to run. And they, they have incredible speed, but also when they run, they raise their tails, the name giving white tail. It's a flag. And there's been a lot of speculation why they raise their tail. Uh, and they always do it when they're escaping uh, predators. Now, the tail twitches back and forth. And there are a couple of things it might be doing. First off, it may be telling other deer that they're related to, there's danger there. But also the movement of the uh, white flag may be making the predator focus on that. And it's possible that in that process, the predator may stumble on something, hit a branch or fall, you know, trip in a log or something when it's chasing the deer. Or if it goes to grab the deer, maybe it'll grab that part. Um, but it seems most of all that that flag could be there just to tell the animal, hey, I know you're there and, you know, I'm running away, I'm faster than you, give up the chase. Perhaps that's what it's doing. It's actually informing the predator that the game is up. And can they ever leap? Here's a, a classic uh, buck, uh, a male deer jumping over a fence. And I wonder if that cow is looking at it thinking, hmm, I wonder if I could try that. I don't think so, Mr. Cow. Large ears, of course, are found on smaller herbivores too. Here's a, a snowshoe hare. And again, they scan the environment. But look at the eyes here on the sides of the head to see all around it. With their great feet, they're able to, to leap away. But when they're escaping danger, they don't run in a straight line. They do a very erratic uh, escape route to help them better get away. Of all the mammals we have, the, you know, the best armed, the best defense may lie in the porcupine with over 20,000 modified hairs called quills that adorn its back, its head, and its tail. And when alarmed, they'll raise them up and form this striking black and white pattern that is visible at night. You have a contrasting pattern of black and white that's quite visible. And that can be a visible warning signal that the animal is well armed. It may well be considered a, uh, an aposematic uh, a bit of coloration, a warning. And those quills, of course, detach very readily um, they can't throw their quills. Porcupines can't shoot their quills at all. They have to hit something with them, but they're very loosely attached. And they do grow back after they're, they're removed. Uh, but uh, uh, they have little overlapping scales on them. So once a, a, a quill hits flesh, it sticks in it, but also works its way through the muscle um, uh, when, it, uh, when the muscles are contracting around it. 
Now, an amazing feature about porcupine quills is that they are covered in antibiotics. And the question is, are the antibiotics there to allow the predator to live and by, with a painful lesson that can be passed on to its offspring? Or is it also there perhaps for the porcupine's own benefit? Because when they fall from a tree, they can impel themselves on their own quills and therefore may help them as well. One animal, one mammal in particular has overcome the porcupine's great defense and that's the fisher. Um, when they come to a porcupine, they will run around it. The porcupine always turns to try to keep its tail toward the attacker's face. But the fisher is fast and they'll slash and bite the face of the porcupine until it weakens. Then finally they'll flip it over and eviscerate it from the underside that has no quills. If you ever come across a porcupine carcass where that's totally gone and all you see left is the, uh, the outer skin and the quills and the hairs, you're seeing the work of a, of a, of a fisher. Very specialized predator. Of course, besides having physical defenses like quills, some mammals have evolved chemical defenses and none is better uh, uh, modified than that of a, a skunk which sprays sulfur alcohol and the attacker. But before they spray their chemical, they give warnings out because chemicals are costly to replace. So a skunk will chomp its teeth, stamp its feet on the ground and raise its, its fur and raise the tail and try to put the back end toward the potential danger. And those white hairs really make a striking pattern against the black body. And these again are highly visible at night when skunks are active. So again, a form of aposomatic warning coloration that's designed for nocturnal animals. This skunk I chased up a hillside and I wanted to <laughs> stupidly try to get a photograph of the skunks back in toward me. And this skunk uh, gave his warnings and look how this white hair is raised up. It stomped his feet, but it also did a partial handstand. I was amazed at that because the Western spotted skunk is known to do handstands, but not the Eastern uh, striped skunk as far as I know. But this guy did that, not facing me. Finally, he turned around and there you can see his weapon ready to fire and I backed off at this point. I didn't want to get sprayed with that sulfur alcohol. Um, so predators have problems to resolve with the prey and the prey has problems, of course, to resolve with the predators. And uh, there's other forms of problems too. Carnivores and herbivores alike can get ectoparasites, they can get ticks. And they try to remove them. Uh, that's when foxes will scratch themselves with their back feet. It could be fleas as well, another rectal parasite. But they try to remove them. Uh, ticks are one of the most common ectoparasites, parasites, and we often see them on snowshoe hair ears, but not so much on the other body parts. And that's because they can use, here's some more in the ear, they can use their hind feet to scratch off possibly on other parts of the body but the ears are harder to remove them from, and that's where the ticks tend to be found. It doesn't kill the snowshoe hare, but annoys it. Beavers also get ectoparasites, and they can groom them as well, but they've got a special tool for taking things out of their hair. They often use their massive hind feet to reach up and pull the hair on other parts of the body. You can see the size difference here in the front paw and the hind foot, tremendous size difference. But what they're doing is not using their big toenail. They have a special toenail. They have a grooming toenail. And that toenail is like a split toenail. It's got a second part on top. Nobody knows how this works, but beavers seem to rub their fur through here. And it's quite possible, it's like a little clamp that will pull out the ectoparasite. So this amazing grooming claw is found on the inner two toes, mostly pronounced on, on one of the toes, but they're the inner toes on a beaver. Hind foot only. Mammals can also have internal parasites. Now, some of these are small, like roundworms and things that we can't see externally, but there are other ones we can see, and they're quite common in mice and chipmunks. It is a parasitic fly's larvae, Cuterebra, and that there's a botfly that lays its eggs on the ground, 
when a mouse or a chipmunk walks over the egg, the heat of that animal causes the egg to suddenly hatch, the larva to shoot up, and it grabs onto the hair of the animal over it. And it crawls along trying to find an orifice. It gets into the orifice, burrows under the skin, and spends its life inside there. It cuts a breathing hole. So it can, because it needs air. And eventually it'll emerge through that. And as this parasite grows, it's really big. And it's amazing that it can leave the chipmunk or mouse and the mouse or chipmunk still lives and they can uh, heal over that spot. This mouse was not killed by the Caterabra coming out of it. It was killed by a mouse trap. And uh, it was caught in a mouse trap. And right as the animal began to cool down, out come the parasite, out came the parasite. You can see how large it is compared to the white-footed mouse it was in. Mammals face other challenges too. Of course, they have starvation is a main problem that predators face. There's also the environmental stresses, especially cold temperatures. And winter active mammals have to have adaptations. Of course, they have warm fur. The under fur is like our underwear for winter. Or, or uh, long, you know, long john sort of thing, and that traps air, uh, heat next to the body. But the guard hair on the outside also grows larger as well, as if they're putting on a winter parka, as well as a good set of of, of long underwear beneath that. Mammals like this muskrat and beaver and otter that are in cold water have, of course, the risk of freezing their digits. And they get a special feature as well. At the base of the leg and the base of the tail of beavers, um, they have a special internal countercurrent system where the, there's a sort of a network, a branching of arteries and veins all around each other at the base of the leg or the tail of the beaver. And that's not used in summertime, but in winter they activate this and blood throws through this network. The arteries coming down bring warm blood from the heart and lungs. And that heat is transferred to the veins that touch it that are bringing cold blood back to the heart. And what happens is then the blood arriving at the feet is cold. It's only a few degrees above the freezing point. And so these feet then are almost, well, they're still warmer than the ice and cold water, but the gradient is less, is lessened by this exchange and less body heat is lost. And that's how they can stand on ice and swim in frigid water without freezing off their feet and tail and so on. Remarkable adaptations. Uh, snowshoe hares turn white for the winter, partly for camouflage, but white hares uh, allow the hare to save 26% more of its energy. It would be lost because white hares are like hollow windows, trapping uh, air and therefore holding more heat next to the body, less heat travels through white hair because it's got hollow cells not filled with colorful particles that give brown or black coloration. Um, and therefore, uh, white is a better color for animals in cold conditions, especially in more open conditions. Other animals, of course, other mammals, I should say, uh, go a bit dormant for the winter. Raccoons go into hollow trees or sometimes in your attic or garage but they go into a slumber and they do awaken on warm days. So it's not true hibernation like that of groundhog that goes down below the frost line and stays dormant for the entire winter. Black bears also go into a form of dormancy, but not true hibernation. Their heartbeat drops down to about eight beats per minute, but their body temperature stays really high, almost near summer levels, and they awaken really readily. They have very odd uh, winter sleeping habits. Uh, they often just uh, uh, get to a, a fallen tree and curl up under the roots or, or that sort of thing and let snow cover them. Now, bears seem to be really powerful animals and they are indeed. That's, that was a big male black bear. And of course, relatively smaller his ears are than the bear you saw earlier. Is the black bear the most powerful animal in the Oak Ridges, uh, Oak Ridges Moraine area? Well, they're pretty powerful, but not the most powerful animal. Um, how about a beaver? Because a beaver can create its own habitat. It can build a dam and a pond that'll support all sorts of water plants and all sorts of aquatic organisms, including muskrats and, and otters and mink and so on. Is this the most powerful animal? Well, maybe, but I think there's another mammal that's even more powerful 
and that's a tiny mammal. This is the metal vole. You see a short little tail here. They live often in fields, but they also live in some uh, woodland edges too. And they can be quite abundant. In fact, of all the mammals in the world, not just in Ontario, but in the world, meadow voles have the greatest population cycles. They can go from low numbers to incredible numbers in a matter of a couple of years. And that's because the females can have multiple broods per year. And those youngsters, after 28 days, can reproduce. So they can have population growth that's so exponential. And after a couple of years, they are abundant. Now, does that make them powerful? No, it's not that feature, but it's because they fuel the economy of so many predators. Almost every predator will eat a meadow vole. A fishers will, martins will, long-tail weasel, short-tail weasel, red foxes, coyotes. Many birds of prey eat them as well. Uh, virtually every hawk, not every hawk, but the majority of them, rough naked red-tailed northern harrier seen here, uh, American kestrels, um, even uh, ravens eat them as well. Um, sorry, um, almost every predatory mammal and bird will eat a meadow vole. And to me, that makes them the most powerful animal because they really fuel the economy of so many predatory animals here in, in Ontario. So I, I named the, the meadow vole the most powerful animal we have, mammal we have. Anyway, mammals are a diverse lot and they're all fascinating. We could explore the life history of any single species here and spend a day just talking about it. So what you've had tonight is a very brief overview of the diversity and remarkable life histories of mammals found in the oak moraine ridges, oak, sorry, <laughs> oak ridges moraine uh, and uh, other parts nearby. And they are remarkable for the diverse appearances and their adaptations for all the different life histories that they employ. So thank you for watching and uh, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the mammals of the Oak Ridges Moraine. All right, great. Sorry, I'm laughing because someone's sneezing downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I know I had a little bit of scratchiness at the beginning, so I'm not gonna turn my video on. And Michael, we do have some questions for you. Okay, uh, was my computer working properly for the presentation? Yes, it was working well, um, and you didn't even have to turn off your video like last time. The sound was no. pretty good. So. Good. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so are you ready to jump into these? I am indeed. Okay, sounds good. And if anybody has um, more questions, it is good to put them in the Q&A box instead of the chat box, um, just for future if you're, if you're typing them in now. Okay, so the first question was early on about beavers. Does, oh, despite the iron in their enamel, are beaver teeth uh, ever in danger of cracking? Um, I haven't heard uh, a beaver's dentist talk about that sort of thing. Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on beaver tooth uh, longevity. But from what I know from uh, what I've read about beavers and from people who've trapped beavers and so on, uh, if it happens, it can't be a common problem. Okay. Um, and Janet is asking about um, some of the, uh, the chipmunks and squirrels that you were showing earlier. Yeah. So the melanistic chipmunk that you showed looked like a gray squirrel, gray melanistic squirrel. If it were melanistic, um, if the chipmunk was melanistic, wouldn't we see the striped pattern through the black fur, much like jaguars? Uh, no, melanistic, generally it's, it's like albinism, it's, it's all. And so all the pigmentation is black in the entire pelage and there is no uh, visible pattern. So no, and, and what's interesting to me about this, with this melanism is that there are certain pockets of it and right now, one of the pockets is around Carp, Ontario, which is near Ottawa. And there was one black chipmunk seen a number of years ago, and then two, then three, 
and now they're becoming fairly widespread. So for some reason, this is a spreading. And we're not at the northern end of the range for eastern chipmunks by any means, but still we're you know, farther north. And so maybe, although they're not winter active, they're down in their burrows. And what chipmunks do is uh, they store food in the fall in underground chambers. Then they go down, they have a chamber for sleeping, but they awaken every several days. They're not true hibernators. And they go and get some food. They also have another chamber that's a lavatory and get rid of their body waste they go back to sleep again. So um, why would they be black? That's not an advantage, and uh, it's just a genetic variation. Uh, but why is this spreading? It's interesting, because albinism, uh, which is a lack of pigmentation, of course, as we saw in that, in that poor gray squirrel, um, uh, it doesn't spread. You know, the animals that are uh, albinistic tend to be disadvantaged, could be eyesight, or more visibility to predators, or, you know, maybe in summer overheating, it could be a variety of things, but um, uh, it doesn't spread. So why is this melanism in pockets starting to spread a little bit? You know, it's a, it's a good question for somebody else to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Always found that interesting. Um, and let's see, next one is from David. As deer ticks are common and can transmit Lyme disease, why do deer populations not have higher uh, incidence of Lyme disease? Well, the deer is just a carrier. Um, uh, so the deer is a carrier, and uh, they they have immunity to it. They spread, you know, the tick gets it, the bacterium from them, and then gives it to other organisms, including us. So the deer really is a carrier. Um, essentially, too, deer have an internal parasite called a, a brain worm. It's a nematode that lives in the brain of a deer, and it has a life cycle that's fascinating. By the way, a lot of these parasites that live in mammals have a really neat life history where the nematode, the, the, the brain worm breeds and the larvae will pass out in the droppings or the eggs pass out and, and hatch. And, and, the, and when uh, an animal eats the droppings, uh, it gets the parasite that travels down through the digestive tract. It burrows out of that into the spinal cord and around the spinal cord up to the brain where it lives. White tail deer, it has no effect on them whatsoever. They evolve with the parasite. But if that parasite gets into a moose, or I believe caribou as well, it'll kill them. As it burrows up the spinal cord, it doesn't eat the uh, uh, tissue near the spinal cord. It goes inside it apparently, it eats uh, primary tissue, then it also gets to the brain and actually eats brain tissue then. And so um, white-tailed deer have great immunity to a number of things uh, that have, they've evolved with and, you know, and other animals can't tolerate them. I believe that's the case for Lyme disease where deer have an immunity to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question um, is about a rabbit in their backyard. So we are in Richmond Hill and there is a rabbit that frequents our backyard. It is not tame or friendly, but it doesn't look like any other wild rabbit we have seen. It is mostly white with a rounded body and face um, and some brown spotting. What do you think that is? Well, I'd have to see a picture of it um, because you would have two types in that area, you, you, you probably have, certainly cottontail rabbits are pretty common. And I imagine there's snowshoe hair on the Oak Ridges Moraine, I would think. And, and anyway, um, if it is a rabbit and has this appearance year round, and it's not a domestic rabbit, it would have to be a cottontail that's uh, leucistic. Leucism is different from albinism in that it's not all or none. Um, albinism is, they can't produce dark pigmentation at all in the entire body, so it's pure white. Even the eyes lack dark, so they're, they're pink. But in leucism, um, dark pigments are produced, but cannot be transported to some parts of the body. So growing hairs, for example, or growing feathers in some parts won't, won't get the, the pigmentation, so they're white. So you can get a patchiness that can be almost all, uh, in some cases, almost entirely pale, sort of, a, sort of a dirty white color, or there can be dark pigmentation in most of the body and white patches. So if your rabbit is truly a wild rabbit and it's a cottontail, then what you're seeing is a leucistic cottontail rabbit. Otherwise, it could be a domestic rabbit that has escaped that looks like a wild rabbit, but that's the best I can do without seeing a picture, or even better, get a DNA sample. Then you can tell exactly 
<laughs> what that animal is. <laughs> I'm sure they'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I can actually get to the Q&A box. I've gone through the chat. So um, there was a white squirrel that you showed, and they're wondering, um, was it albino or leucistic? Lucistic? That, was al um, that was albino. That, yeah, that squirrel had albinism, and it had mange, and it was freezing. So I don't know why it swam across this frigid creek. Perhaps it was chased by a predator on the far shore. But I encountered it in my canoe, and it could barely move in the water. The water was like four degrees Celsius at the time. It was late November. And, and it moved across, and I didn't know what it was. I could not figure out this animal. When I crawled under the log, I still didn't know what it was. It turned around to face me, and I got a few photographs, and it crawled across the log to the far side, like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. You know, it, it was I thought, what is this? Then I finally realized that it was an albino gray squirrel that had mange. And uh, what a poor animal that was. I felt sorry for it, but it was doomed. Aww. It wasn't going to survive. It can never survive the winter uh, because gray squirrels don't hibernate. And uh, so it had no chance of survival. Yeah. Okay. This is, a, I think this is an easy question. Um, are there possums on the marine? Uh, because they do have the Mississauga. And I will say it's opossums, isn't it? Yep, opossums, yep, that's correct, because possums are found in Australia. But opossums, yeah, Virginia opossum, and I imagine they are. They, they're a success story. Um, I worked at Point Pili, which is the southernmost point in Canada, uh, many years ago as a naturalist, and there were no opossums there then. And now they're common. They're common as roadkills, and they've spread. They spread into the Bruce Peninsula. They spread east, or the Gulf. I'm sure they're in the Moraine and surrounding areas. They're in the Kingston area, and even now being found near Ottawa. And I think part of the reason is uh, of a climate change, because they have, ex you know, they haven't got all the adaptations for really cold conditions, and uh, yet they're expanding north. And uh, I think that. You know, the climate change is, is certainly part of that. So um, somebody who can tell me if they found the ridges and, and, you know, and the moraine, but I suspect they are uh, because they're found uh, all around it. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a question, or we have a question actually for Aileen. So hopefully, Aileen, you can answer this. Um, are there oak, or is the Oak Ridges moraine... Um, protected from hunting or our, pro our properties or the Oak Ridges Moraine uh, in general? I'm not sure what that question is for. Yeah, um, so we have 60 properties and we protect them in different ways. Um, and one of the ways is through conservation easement agreements. So that is an, um, a conservation hold that goes on the deed of the land that the owner puts on so they can sell the property um, or if they they pass away the protection on the natural areas that they love stays with the property so it's like a legacy now when that is set up some people may choose to put in something to allow hunting um, but there's usually some forms of restrictions on it because it is conservation based so it might be um, if we do protect farmland if there's you know um, a risk to their animals they can um, use hunting so with those properties that are still in the ownership of private owners, but we have the conservation easement on it. Um, some can allow hunting to a certain level. On our nature reserves, which are the properties we own full, um, so we are the owner of those and they are donated or, donated or purchased, um, there is no hunting. So hopefully that answers your question. And if you have any other information or questions about that, you can just send us an email. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Aileen. All right, and we'll go back to Michael. So um, the next one is about martens. Uh, are martens found as far south as, as the Oak Ridge's moraine? Mammal books seem to show their range stopping farther north than that. Also, I know fishers are larger and their tails are bushier, but is there an easy way to identify one versus the other? Okay, yeah. The last part of your question first, telling fishers from Martin. Um, the heads are very different. Fishers have a bear-like head, smaller ears, more blunt face. So they, and, and generally they, they're more grizzled, but, but they have a bear-like appearance. Martins have large ears and a, and a more pointed snout. They're more fox-like in their shape. 
That's one good way. Another way is that martens uh, tend to have a color, well, not always orange, but they have a lighter throat. It's often orange colored. So they got a patch down here that fishers don't have. Um, fishers are stockier animal too, and, and martens are uh, tend to be uh, not as robust overall. But I think the heads are one big, big clue in that the shape is very different. And then the other part was, are they found as far south? Well, um, I doubt they're found in the Oak Ridge Moraine. They probably come close. I would assume that they're in the Peterborough area farther north. In eastern Ontario, though, from there, they actually come down as far as almost to Kingston on the front neck axis. So I wouldn't rule out the possibility of them being on the moraine because you look at Kingston and they're found just farther uh, north by, we're talking, you know, near the Queen's Biology Station, there's Martin there. Um, I think it's possible. Um, but um, uh, you have to ask the expert on mammals of the marine, if martens have been recorded there or not. Okay, um, and we're gonna do two more uh, last questions. So this one is, with the spread of ticks, could the threat to um, animals become more of a problem? Well, the, the ticks seem to be a much greater problem for us than for the wild mammals that uh, they may be on as well. Most of the ticks on mammals um, are wood ticks uh, and other ticks that the mammals can tolerate. Uh, but we have the problem with Lyme disease. Uh, and so the spread of ticks, which is incredible, isn't it? Because only in the 70s, I think, in the 70s, it was just, what's, what's that, 40, 50 years ago? Oh, time just go by, doesn't it? Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's not 50 years ago, but oh, darn close. But um, back then, Lyme disease was, was only known with a tick from Long Point, you know, that, the southern point of Lake Erie. And they spread. And now deer ticks are everywhere. Uh, hotbeds around Ottawa now and carp region. It, it's, it's unbelievable what's happened in the last 40, 50 years. And why is this spread? Because uh, white-tailed deer have been, you know, that far north. Has it been something associated with climate change? Possibly not. But uh, for some reason, uh, deer ticks, the black-legged tick, has spread uh, so much in Ontario. But the real problem it poses is for us, I think. We're the, the ones. And actually, that's not too bad. There are far too many of us around now. And so if our population was thinned out a little bit, maybe it'd be a better thing for the wild inhabitants of this province. <laughs> I will say the ticks seem to be early this year. My dog's already gotten a large handful. So check yeah, your I, dogs. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that the warm spill we had in March has in, you know, induced the ticks to come out. And so the mm -hmm. thing is, we can take precautions for them. If you go hiking in the woods, make sure your pant legs are tucked into your socks and uh, wear lighter color clothes so you can see them better. You can, you can use sprays on your legs. I think uh, uh, D, not DDT, um, DEET uh, is one that people often use. Yeah. And I've heard that you can buy from uh, horse stores uh, a spray too that has I don't know if you can hear me, Michael. I think you might have just cut out, unless it's just me. Yeah, no, it looks like he's frozen. <laughs> okay, maybe he will wait a second. I don't want to leave him hanging. <laughs> I'm dying to know what it is you can get in horse stores. <laughs> I know, me too. And uh, okay. I don't know, like, did you see that last question? Have there been... In, been any evidence of COVID in our wild mink population? I don't know if there's any research. I haven't that's heard specific. anything, no. Um, so I, I don't, I try not to watch the news too much about COVID because it's a bit depressing, but I haven't heard anything. And yeah, so. Oh, oh it looks like he dropped off, I think. So, oh. well, that's a funny, fun way to end the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll say uh, thank you so much to everybody for coming and um, and we're sorry for the delay at the beginning, but thank you for sticking around. I see that everyone or most people enjoyed um, Michael's presentation and, and we always do too. So we're happy he was able to 
to come back for another one. Um, if you have any more sort of itching questions or you got or you had questions that we didn't get to, feel free to send them to me. Send me an email and we'll try to get those answered for you, okay? Uh, okay, well, everybody have a good evening and hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar on uh, May 20th, all about moths. Have a good night, everybody.